Okay, gentlemen, if I can have your attention for a moment. Uh, in case you don't know, I'm Steve Schneider. Uh, I'm uh, the vice chairman of the Gulf Coast branch of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science, and Technology. And uh, well, just a little bit about our institute to begin with. Uh, we're a professional society and a learned society. And that sounds kind of diametrically opposed, but it's not really. We have, we're a worldwide organization. We have 20,000 plus members all over the world in 100 different branches. We have two, two branches in the U.S. We, have, <clears throat> we do professional recognition within the Institute. If you're a member, you can be a fellow. We professionally register marine engineers as chartered engineers or incorporated or engineering technicians. We do that on our own through the Engineering Council in the UK. And I'll give you one thing I can tell you from personal experience. If you are registered in the UK as a chartered engineer or an incorporated engineer, that is recognized everywhere in the world. Whereas I can guarantee you that a PE from the US is not. It doesn't work that way. <coughs> Uh, we have an online library that has 125 years worth of papers, documents, books. We put out monthly magazines, we put out monthly uh, reports. We have a thing going now where it's free membership for students. And that's a good thing, but the better part about it is after they graduate, they can maintain their full membership at a graduated scale over a period of four years so that when they graduate from school they don't have to get hit with a $400 membership fee the first year out of college. We used to lose a lot of members that way. We now have an online master's degree program that has about six disciplines and it's growing every day. <coughs> it, that may be the biggest thing we have going. You can actually get your master's degree online. I had one gentleman at the OTC told me he did, he did it in 14 months. I had another one that told me that he thought it was going to take him three years. So in other words, it's pretty much at your own speed. We also have a thing called special interest groups. I think we're up to about 17 or 18 now that have to do with oceanography, uh, ballast water, undersea pipelines, for a bunch of them. And this is an area where if we have a SIG in your expertise, online information you can get is just unlimited because it's basically everybody in the world you can connect with that's in that special interest group. We run these technical meetings somewhere between seven or eight times a year, I believe, right, Nick? And if you're interested in joining us, you can see Nick or Graham or myself at the end. And right now, I'd like to introduce you to, how do you say it? Mark Bordas. 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 Yeah. Bordas. Who is going to give us tonight's lecture on how to do a better job of leading. And I'll turn it over to him right now and let him get started. Thank you very much, Steve. All right, appreciate it. Uh, I'll tell you about how this presentation came about. First of all, I want to thank the, uh, the chapter for inviting me. This, this came about about a year ago, based on an article on this topic that was published in the uh, Use of Business Journal. It was based on about three years of research I did with uh, client companies. On um, What I began to hear from the feedback from the guys that I worked with that uh, despite their best efforts to get promoted into leadership roles, only about um, three out of seven of, them, seven of them actually were either, either to sustain it or make it and continue to be able to be successful in that leadership role. And it, it really created a lot of curiosity in my part about why was that transition so low? Why if we went through a technical track and everybody wants to be a particular leader of an engineering company, either a marine or construction or structural or electrical or whatever, but why did so few of them actually make it 
to that particular point in time where they were successful. And through a lot of uh, survey and interviews and focus groups and stuff, I began to formulate the understanding about why they were able to make it if they were successful and what was missing if they were not. And so I, I wrote an article about that, and then this uh, came about when I got referred here. And I've made this presentation at many different associations, particularly those that have an engineering focus. So hopefully you'll find some value from it. Um, uh, if you have, uh, quote, uh, colleagues, young engineers on their way up, I think this presentation will be helpful for them as well. Like anything else, uh, if you can have a quick transition to get you somewhere faster, it's more effective. Uh, a couple of things on the table. One, uh, I have a little self-assessment which we will take uh, later on in the presentation. And there's a card, I, I publish a monthly blog, and if you'd like to be on that mailing list for the blog, you can either fill that out and give it to me at the end of the presentation or give me a card and I'll include you in, in my mailing list. So. No really hard selling here, just I publish about probably 50 articles a year, both on LinkedIn and the blogs that I put out, and some of it is just research that I do. So the topic is boosting your leadership, leadership IQ, how to successfully transition from being a technical contributor, and I would classify that would be engineer, accounting, finance, anyone who's in a technical role that needs to transition or would like to transition to a leadership role, and what's required to kind of make that work. Mark, quick, quick question, yes. what was your, how did you end up here? How, what's your background? Um, well, I'm just curious on that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a high curiosity on different things. I have a master's in business administration, and I also have a master's in social work. And I went to the American Graduate School of International Management, Thunderbird, in, in Tempe, Arizona. Where I actually studied a lot about uh, marine and vessels and stuff like that. And in the old days, uh, I used to work at the American Productivity and Quality Center, and I was a Malcolm Baldrige Quality Assessor, and led me to more behavioral-based types of things, so I began to kind of position myself as a behaviorist. And then that evolved into more change management role, as it's known today. So any company that transitioned through either a software implementation or M&A or re-engineering or restructuring, they finally realized after many, many years and many SAP implementations and whatever, that it's great technology, but, but damn, they can't do it unless the people are going to support it. And so that became the whole emergent of the field of the management of change. And my philosophy was if you're not managing the change, change is going to manage you. There's no middle ground. Either you're going to be proactive or reactive. It's still going to happen. And so that's the track that I followed. I spent 10 years as a partner at a center. Uh, in that role, and I basically traveled and worked in about 35 countries as, as part of that. So, okay. like I said, I consider myself a behaviorist. I think I understand human behavior pretty well. Uh, I'm not a technical guy, although I've been involved in a lot of technical projects. I always say I'm on the people side of the change, uh, not the integrator who tells you to close all the dots and, and do all that. So this is uh, part and parcel to how can you get people to understand that um, and I, I also do presentations on change management as well. No, thank you question. very much. I'm glad those engineers need social work. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've worked with a lot of companies. Actually, the, one of the most interesting companies I worked with was the American Bureau of Shipping, ABS, in Sealand. Uh, I found that pretty darn interesting at a time when ABS was launching their digital management vessel initiative. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. But I think it was a pretty progressive move about three years ago maybe four years ago, they implemented a hybrid of Maximo to digitize all their vessels and all the companies could contribute to it, their data, and then um, make the whole more process more efficient and more effective. And I thought it was a pretty bold move from their CEO to try to jump ahead of the Lloyds and everybody else in that space. And I found that a very enjoyable project to help them in handling the uh, transition of the, of the organization which originally would start out to be a project, would turn out to be a major transformation for the whole company. So that's a little bit of the background. Uh, part of my research that I did with another partner many years ago was a time in which there were a lot of product companies that their shelf space on their software products was deteriorating very rapidly. <laughs> they needed to find an alternative revenue stream, and that was to put in services as part of their companies as well. And that led to a lot of research in the book that I had uh, published called S-Business, uh, Reinventing the Services Organization. 
So that's the whole advent, if you want to put it in more context. If you think of IBM as a computer company before they also became known as IBM Global Services, that's the kind of place many of those companies were in 10, 15 years ago. And now you see that all over the place. So I've worked with companies like 3M, Toro, all those companies that now have services management as part of their portfolio. Silver, bronze, gold, that kind of stuff. So that, that was a very interesting transition to help those companies kind of move, move forward. So this is a, a real important beginning slide because you'll see a lot of this presentation has a great deal to do with soft skills as being a necessary ingredient to how technical contributors can move to, to a more leadership type role. And why is that? Most of the business schools you go to in the engineering disciplines, et cetera, they're going to teach you everything you need to know about engineering. But if you look at the curriculum, you're not going to see as much stuff about the behavior side of what they do and how to work with all those soft skills. So that becomes a very necessary component to that. And even as far back as uh, you know, 2017, you began to see the emergence of many, many articles coming out of the Wall Street Journal and LinkedIn, et cetera, that companies are beefing up tremendously their training programs in soft skill areas. And then a survey of 900 executives in the Wall Street Journal will basically say, this is probably even minimally equal to or more important than technical skills, which was kind of heretic talk many years ago. So this is really emerging as the number one capacity that individuals have to have if you want to be able to get into those leadership roles and sustain those leadership roles. And one of the, few th one of the many things I've learned about behavior, it's not always that totally predictable as we're all individually different. So is behavior. But if you don't have some groundswell of an understanding of what that is and how to work with that successfully, you're a little bit behind the, uh, behind the eight ball. So your first uh, quiz of the day, since I'm positioning myself as a behaviorist, so my first quiz for you all today is that you see four symbols here. And which one of these uh, symbols, this is like a little bit of a Rorschach test, can you most identify? Or would you say I'm more an athlete, a visionary, a coach, or a technician? So by raising your hand, how many selected athletes? Not an athlete here. Okay. Not anymore. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not anymore. What about visionary? Any visionaries here? Not one visionary. Okay. Any coaches here? All right. One, two, three, four. That's getting there. Now the rest of you are either technicians or you need to be retired at the moment. Any technicians? That would be the remainder. Okay. So why is this important? And that's pretty consistent with uh, a lot of the engineering groups that I've worked with. So what about each of these characteristics, if you will, what does that really mean? Well, if you had selected athlete as an example, basically the behavioral characteristics of people who define themselves as athletes, the Texan football team aside, if you watched the last game on Sunday, you know, basically these are very competitive people. Their power, they believe in their own personal power. They believe in, can do things with a high degree of endurance. They know how to pace themselves. They typically are perceived as fair. They encourage others, and they like to win. Right? There's not a negative comment in any one of those characteristics. Well, what about a visionary? <clears throat> Someone who defines their characteristic behaviorally as an innovation or visionary person has usually a strong sense of being an innovator, a great, they're not intimidated by any kind of circumstance or situation that might occur. They believe themselves agents of change. They can be somewhat unconventional, and they always look at future possibilities. They're not negative, they're very positive people. Those who put themselves into the coach category see themselves as compassionate, sort of the people side of things. They are a big team player. They believe a lot in boundaries of circumstances, as well as they are um, they're great listeners. They are great communicators, they like share learning, and particularly they can identify with walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, right? It's not just all about themselves, it's about other people as well. So if you selected coach, hopefully those characteristics uh, embody yourself as well. Now, for the rest of us, you know, consider ourselves technicians, if you will. There's nothing negative about any of these. They are typically analytically oriented. They believe in data, the whole issue of big data, knowledge, details, that 
uh, never-ending quest for truth, that there's an ultimate answer for things, and they believe in management of risk, that there is risk out there and manage, and risk can be managed. So a periphery, if you will, of different behaviors connected with four different types of models of thinking, if you will. And so what about a leader? Which one of these does a leader have to demonstrate to be successful? Well, the reality is you have to be good at all of them. You can say, wow, that's a pretty heavy lift to have to do. That's a pretty big footprint. But my research has shown, actually, that they're all of kind of equal value. And so this is the beginning of your own thinking about my own self-assessment. If I'm very heavily weighted toward the technical side, which other aspects of these behavioral attributes do I need to strengthen to have more balance between the, t between the four of them? And my research basically showed that successful leaders who transitioned from a technical contributor role eventually was able to bring balance to all four of these and to demonstrate that with both their teams, their bosses, and other parts of the organization. So you might say that's a tall order, but that's not necessarily the end of the story. Uh, now actually, this is a true story. Uh, the name has been shielded a little bit to protect my friend. But this is a story about uh, Tom. And Tom, and you've probably seen this a million times, right? Tom's a senior engineer with an outstanding track record of performance, working across multiple projects for eight years. He was in the trenches. He knew how to do stuff. Uh, his performance reviews indicated a professional who is technically gifted. He got a five out of five every time. And is able to work on all sides of the project and the value chain. As a result, he was uh, promoted to the head of a company operations with 12 direct reports. 520 staff. <clears throat> However, 12 months later, he is failing as a leader. Gosh, what happened to Tom? Tom was shocked. What, what's going on? Feedback from his boss and peers indicated that Tom uh, needs to think more strategically, manage change more effectively, uh, be a more effective coach, improve his relationship, trust building, and communication skills, especially his approach to leading, managing people. And Tom said, gee, is that all I got to do? You know, anything else? Uh, the only bright spot in the 12 months that happened is that now he understands that what got him to this point in his career won't really help him move forward to becoming a high performance leader. So what does Tom need to do going forward to change failure into success? Anybody want to be a consultant for a minute and share their point of view? What do you think he needs to do? Quit and go back to working in the field where he came from or what? What? It needs to define the problem. It needs to define the problem. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for sharing that. Anything else? Probably what would your advice be to Tom? Probably has to stop being an engineer. Start being a manager. Okay. All right. What else? Don't do everything yourself. Don't do everything yourself. Okay. I think you think you're getting there. I think what 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 happened to Tom is not too unrealistic. You know, the assumption in the company was if you're a technically competent person, you will automatically be a highly successful leader. And that's not the case. A little, little laundry list there of the things that he needed to work on really came full strength to hand. Now, he was actually able to turn that around after many, many efforts and seminars and workshops and coaching and different types of things. But it was a real awakening for him and the company as well that both sides of that, if you go back to my four symbols, are important in, in this kind of role. So leads me to the next topic. Uh, can a leader ever be too competent? What do you say about that? Can a leader ever be too competent? You're saying yes. Why yes. do you say yes? Well, because he's just too damn good at what he does, okay. and he expects everybody else to be just like him, following his example only. And I'm sure you mean him or her, is that uh, correct? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you meant, right? Of course. Of course. Okay. All right. So everybody, yeah, you can be too confident that everybody's got to be just like him or her. Any other any other thinking behind can a leader be too confident? No. Do you see people who are very good managers who are, don't know a damn thing okay. about what their company is doing and what <coughs> their division whatever is doing or not proficient right. at that? Sure. So they might have a very narrow view. They might be technically competent, but they don't maybe see the whole picture. Oh, yeah. The, the question is competent in what? Managing people or 
Uh, uh, technically. Okay, uh, great question. Competent in what? Competent in their technical skills? Competent in their people skills? Competent in their organizational skills? Competent in their ge uh, cultural skills, geographic skills, language skills? Competent in what? So I think that's, a, that's an important distinction. And uh, I think there's a couple of things here that, that really bring this home. One, if a manager, as Stephen mentioned, everybody needs to be like him or her, you begin to see that uh, some things that I've, I've actually personally witnessed this many times, that uh, the quote, overly competent manager sees no problem at all is correcting their team members in front of your management or customers. Any, any problem with that? Yeah, yeah lots of more. problems. You know, lose face right away, right? Not a, not a good formula. Uh, make all the small decisions as well as the big ones. Any problems with that? Yep. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, pretty only, obvious, right? Yeah. Totally. You, should, you should only make the decisions that your people can. Right, and you kind, of, kind of micromanage everything, right? You don't leave any decisions to anybody else. Roll up your sleeves to help out, uh, causing a team member to stand aside while you watch you do the job, right? Great, why am I working here? Make a last minute decisions to make little improvement because the team needs to react in a panic. You know, being proactive versus reactive. Uh, publicly overrides the plan of a second in command. That's really very dangerous, called getting yourself fired pretty quickly. Uh, always feel you're right, no matter right. It was in Nixon said, don't, uh, doesn't matter what I say, I'm right 100% of the time. Uh, fail to engage and inspire your team to be their best, right? And all of those things, you know, I've personally seen many managers who believe they're hugely competent but yet demonstrating all of these things. So the bottom line, a boss who micromanages like a coach who wants to get in the game, leaders guide and support them, sit back to cheer from the sidelines or from behind the scenes. The success of the team is really where all the valor and credibility and celebration come, not from just the leader being out there doing everything him or herself all the time and everybody standing aside and watching them be, if you will, overly competent. It's a little bit lessons from the field. Uh, this is another study that I did uh, maybe two years ago. Uh, well, part of it was in 1718. What performing behaviors do, do your top leaders exhibit that your average performers don't? We have, let's say we have average performers and we have top performers in your company. Let's say we have average performers and star performers. So what do you think the number one high performing behavior was in that study, this is about 150 managers that I that I surveyed and talked to. Any guess about number one was what distinguished a high star performer from just an average performer? Sort of a C plus versus an A person. Mm -hmm. Any guess? Yeah. Communicate division. Okay, communicate division. Okay. Any any other point of view? I would say non micromanager. Non micromanager. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Delegate. Okay, delegate? Yeah. Okay. Actually, great communication, great listening skills, right? So you were correct there. Number two was they were able to seize the initiative. Again, being proactive versus reactive. A little bit of that visionary view of seeing what's ahead and how to be able to position themselves successfully to be there at the right time. They were able to build trust, and I have a little presentation I'll share with you and we'll get a chance to have some fun with. How do you build trusting relationships and build those relationships. Number four was they had big picture thinking. Even though they were in a particular department, they had both a global view and a divisional view beyond the boundaries of where they were particularly working. They had business acumen. They understood the business. And I think this is a difficulty for many technical people in presentations I've sat through many times, very painfully, where technical presentations are made, but someone asks a really hard basic business question. What does this look like a return on investment, return on capital, uh, return on human, human, uh, human capital invested, et cetera? They're hard pressed to answer those questions because they lack some business acumen about the totality of the business. And you'll see one of the uh, earmarks of how you move through this is to rotate through various functions in the company so you end up getting that point of view. And lastly, they demonstrated extreme confidence and courage despite what was going on in the company. So, not a wildly scientific study here, but that's how it fell out in terms of, in terms of the top six. As we uh, think about it, uh, and I interviewed successful leaders in that process, and I said to them, okay, what made the difference for you? And some of these are just personal quotes, 
you know, uh, there is some commonality, I think, which runs through that. And one, they said, uh, they're providing me digital business management direction. And I think uh, somebody asked me in the social hour what the leading edge was. And I've been through all these cycles, totally quality management, Malcolm Bolivar Award, ISQC, uh, the European Quality Award, and somebody asked me, what, what's the number one initiative now? Big data used to be that. And it's a whole movement now to creating a digital workforce, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, uh, internet everywhere. That, that's really what's happening now. But do most executives understand that? No. Do they know how to begin and make that whole process work? No. Do they know how to transition through all that now? No. But that is the leading thing that's happening now. Agile, agile implementation, and the digital management. And just how far do you think this will go? Will it ever get to the point where they're going to let the machines do their thinking for them? Uh, no, I think, I, I think AI, let's just say artificial, sometimes intelligence, has its limitations, robotics and everything else. But I think a digital business environment in the workforce is something that's going to accelerate like crazy now. Will there be a negative impact on uh, individual employees? Yeah, probably. Uh, we need less employees? Yes, probably. Will the company become much more efficient, a lot faster and more effective in what they do and make more money? Absolutely, absolutely. So is that fair to the bottom line? Well, that can be anybody's argument. But I think the artificial intelligence thing, uh, I, I've done a fair amount of work in the creating a total customer experience and I've just been amazed about what artificial intelligence can do, predictive analytics, in really capturing what customers want and targeting the organization to meet those particular needs. It's just amazing at incredible speed and therefore jumping ahead of competition uh, and, and saving a lot of money. Uh, is a trust builder not a trust buster? I'll give you a great example of being a trust buster. I had a client once in Dallas and uh, they owed me about $40,000 for work, and I couldn't get them to pay. And um, there's one woman who was a blocker, shouldn't be a woman, there's an individual in the company who uh, was blocking the payment. And um, uh, I made a big stink out of this because the work was accelerating work. It was great work, and got great praise, and met all the objectives, and the company was still not, would not pay. And lo and behold, uh, I went over this individual's head and finally got paid. Well, wouldn't you know it on a commuter flight from Houston to Dallas in those little small airplanes or Houston or Austin? Guess who I ended up sitting next to on the whole flight? The woman whose head I went over, right, to get the bill paid. So in that circumstance, probably was not the best solution I could have come up with because it shifted from being a highly trusted consultant to them to really being a trust buster. One of the lessons I learned, you never go above people's stature in the company to get what you want. There's other ways to skin the cat, so to speak, to get what you need. So that, that's an important, what they learned is not to be a trust buster, but a trust builder. And I'll share with you how to do that a little later. To lead courageously, we've talked a little about that. Uh, teamwork is so important now. There's so many books being written about accelerating the team to be successful, creating a high performance team in the organization, not just the individual, it really is sustaining the test of time. Uh, this next one is a favorite topic of mine, is champion change. Uh, just as you would see in every company, supervisory skills training. Every manager has to go through it, right? Six modules, 10 modules. What is happening now, and I'm actually happy to see this, that being built into that curriculum now is they have to learn how to be change managers, how to manage change in their organization. And you never used to see that. It was always considered some side thing or consulting thing. Now it's being built into supervisory training, so you're expected to understand change methodologies, how to manage behavior, how to manage transformation, et cetera. Is so, that a uh, evaluation criteria? Uh, evaluation in, in what regard? Uh, well, I'm just looking at the problem of change for the sake of change. You've got to be careful because if you evaluate people on how much they champion change, you're going to get change just because right. of that. Well, let me, let me make a distinction. Um, the management of change is never done individually and singularly for just to do it for the sake of change. Change management has always was and will always be a support function to support the business case, whatever that business case might be. If that's a software implementation of SAP, an M&A, an acquisition, 
whatever. It supports the business case to get those who are impacted by that business transformation, if you will, to support what's going to happen and be endowed to make sure that that happens. But you'll see there's some definite components in there about how you manage change. There's some skills in that, and there's some components and technical process and some training that goes along with it. So that's an important element. Coaching and developing others, another big factor. You'll see later in the presentation one of the earmarks of this transition that as soon as someone begins to get on that track to move toward leadership, they are assigned a coach and mentor in the company who stays with them for at least two or three years. Someone who's been through the ropes, who understands the culture, the organization, the politics, who can help that person as a sounding board as, as they move forward. And they understand how to motivate people in teams. They act with integrity and they stay positive. Now, you might say, well, that's motherhood and apple pie. But you'd be amazed about how many evaluations I've seen of people who get rejected. I did spend uh, two years with a pretty well-known search firm called Allen Austin, and I was a partner there. And this kind of criteria came up over and over again that got people ejected or accepted into the role from the clients who wanted to basically recruit them. So even though nice, if you will, not necessarily a waste of effort. So I'm gonna, I present here basically a five-step process on how to transition from being this technical contributor to ideally being a successful leader. Now, many things in life, there's no guarantee of success. I will simply say that if you follow these steps, or your colleagues, or your mentees, or your people in your organization, the probability of success is a lot higher than the probability of failure. Now you say, well, that's great consultant talk, right? Yeah, but it's true. There is no guaranteed formula here. But if you follow these steps, the predictability, the probability of success will be higher than the probability or predictability of failure. So that's like a 3.8 on a 5-point scale. So the first one is to understand your leadership potential through a self-assessment. Now, self-assessments can be kind of interesting. And your first handout you have on your desk, if you don't have a pen, you can just follow along. Uh, I'm going to ask you to self-assess here. I promise I will not put your answers on the internet, although we will talk about this. Or it will emerge when you run for political office for the Senate seat in the state of Texas. That's right. <laughs> but you should have one at every desk. Okay, so this is not a complicated assessment, right? There's three ways you can answer this. The first one is, whatever the statement says, you can say, I do not possess this attribute or do this skill well at all. That's a damn honest thing to say. And nobody else is going to steal your answer and say you should have given yourself a three. That's your own self-assessment. If you answer any of these questions number two, your predictor is, I seldom possess this attribute or do this somewhat well. That's sort of middle of the ground. That's okay. Or number three, I possess this attribute or do this skill very well. Great. Blow your own horn here. That's just great. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, if you lie to yourself, that's interesting too. If you answer it honestly, there's some interesting feedback for you, right? So the first statement says, I enjoy creating success for others. You say, well, basically, I'm really kind of an egotist, right? I don't care if anybody else succeed, if succeeds. I'm only interested in my own success. So you might say, I don't possess this attribute at all, and the hell with you all, right? So that's fine. You can answer one, two, or three on that. Number two, I initiate trust-based relationships. Right? I mean, I go out of my way to make sure that I have some trust-based relationships that I foster, that I really seek that out. That's one, two, or three. Either I possess this, or I do this somewhat well, or I possess, uh, I possess it actually do this very well and not at all. I take a stand on my values, and that can be very thin ice for many companies. Taking a stand can mean I'm going to quit because this is either illegal or unethical or so contrary to my personal values, I cannot continue to work in this company. Now, I can honestly say I've left some companies that I really like the company, but my own personal values was in direct conflict with the direction the company was taking. I could not justify myself staying there. And sometimes, you know, when I had college bills to pay for my son, you know, I, I swallowed hard and I said, okay, maybe this will change over time. Number three, number four, I would prefer to work on tasks with a team versus an individual. And that, that's okay. Some people really do work better individually than they do with a team. So that's number four. Number five, I motivate others to embrace change. Change, in my view, is a very positive thing. And people should not fear it as much. You know, even resistance can be a positive thing. 
because it basically gives you information that you can do something with it. You can solve some problems with. So why are you resisting this change? I need to understand because I'm a year away from retirement because I don't have the skills because it's going to lose my pension. Okay, I need to understand that so we can manage that to have a happy ground a little bit here versus just putting our head in the sand. I consider myself a coach to others. I'm open, willing, and able to coach someone, you know, that will either proactively move in that direction or be receptive if somebody asks me to be a coach to them. Number seven, I can switch from tactics to strategy easily. Now, that's somewhat is difficult, particularly if you're not close to some of the strategic issues in the company. We're often very consumed in the day-to-day -day tactics. The day in the life of a marine engineer is probably pretty black and white. You understand what's needed, you go forward and do it. I can make this tough decisions regardless of people's approval or potential rejection. Well, hats off to you if you can probably do that with a full stomach and swallowing hard, right? It's like saying, hey, I believe enough in what I'm doing here, I'm gonna take that kind of stand. And number 10, I inspire and provoke others to excel. So if anything, if, if you will, is, is a laundry list of 10 attributes, and I'm not saying you gotta have a five in everything, but I think if you look at these and you score either one or two in some of them, then maybe your personal goal becomes, how can I move these to a three in every area over time? Now that can either come about through remote learning or through on-the-job experience or through rotation of functions, or something, but how can I move some of that value set to number three? So let me ask you on this list, and of course not based on your personal thing that you checked off, which one of these things of these 10 items here have you personally seen as more di most difficult for people to do? Four. Number four. To work on tasks individually, why is that, Steve? Nothing, because it all depends on the task. There's a time and a place for everything. Right, something that can be done more effectively and efficiently as an individual versus a team. Okay, any other views about what on that list is, is more challenge, most challenging to do? Number 10. Number 10? Inspire and provoke others to excel? Yeah, uh, you know, face it, there might be some dead wood in organizations or those average performers who are less than average, right? And no matter what we do or incentives we throw at them or challenging tasks, they're just not interested in uh, in excelling at what they're doing. I won't mention the country, but I, I did work overseas in a country once where we went in and interviewed the managers, and the managers were on top of the desk sound asleep at two o'clock. So let's say getting them to manage to excel would have been an extremely tough challenge. Okay. How about it? You should be able to provoke others to excel to their the limit of their potential. Well, that's right. I mean, ideally, you know, maybe I'm old school, yeah, but I do believe everybody has more potential, more reserve of potential than they ever use, right? And, you know, my personal belief is that one of the goals and challenges in life is that you should always be trying to exceed your potential. It's a never-ending journey, and some people are just happy being where they are, and they're just not interested in cutting constant learning. Number uh, eight can be hard. Number eight, yeah, challenge others to make the right, right choices. Why, why is that difficult? A lot of pushback from somebody who may not see the right choice the same way you do. Yeah, they might just see the world I, differently. I've already got it all together. I need advice That's right. That. You know, don't confuse who's that with Nixon. They don't confuse me with the facts my mind is made up, yeah. right? So, yeah. And, you know, as a consultant, you know, they said, well, don't you go in and tell companies what to do? I said, never. I go in and I share the pros and cons of every option that, or the list of three or four that is potentially available to them. And then I said, ultimately, the decision is yours to make. To my best judgment, here are the pros and cons of each choice. What do you think about that? At the end of the day, it's your future at stake. It's not mine. Right? It might be if I give them the wrong options to think about. Right? But I, I never come and say, you must do this, although I have pretty strong points of view. And if they push me on that, they say, Mark, what's the answer here? And my consultant answer always is, well, it all depends. What does that mean? Well, it all depends on a lot of different things, right? I, I never really give a definite answer. If you want to know what my experience has been, I'd be happy to share that, but it may not be the experience you're, you're going through. Which of these would be easiest to do? Which one do you think would be easiest to do? Number three. Number three, stand for my values. Yeah, I, I guess it depends maybe on age and circumstance. Yeah, that number three. 
Yeah, it can be hard, right? I might be a year away from retirement. I might just got in a new role, a new boss, right? Who may not see things. You know, I worked on a project a couple of years ago, and the client was a very interesting fellow. He happened to be a nuclear engineer, ex, uh, I think, nuclear submarine uh, captain or something. And the first day I met him, he said three things. And I tried to give him an answer on the thing once. He said three things. When he said, Mark, when I ask you a question, I only want three answers. Yes, no, and I don't know. I said, no elaboration is no. That's all I want to know. Yes, no, or I don't know. And every time I tried to elaborate on one of those, he would jump back and say, I thought I told you I'm only interested in three answers. Yes, no, and I don't know. So, you know, number three or number four, you know, sometimes you can't change the dots on the paper, right? I mean, that's what it was. I learned to work with them over the time. But, uh, you know, it was frustrating for me because I obviously like to talk and explain. Okay, so this is a, a self-assessment for yourself or for others that you work with. And I think number three here is an ideal. But I think when I talk to the leaders who have been successful from technical contributor roles, they were certainly pushing toward number three. Now, does that happen instantaneously? No, never. There's nothing instant in life, not even instant jello anymore, right? So I think <coughs> this becomes your own little learning curve of where I could step in and increase some of this to help move in that, in that direction. Okay, number two. So the first one, you have some leadership self-assessment to understand where you are. Number two, broaden skills and capabilities through taking a non-traditional career path. And this is very interesting because a lot of people are pigeonholed in one type of career path and they don't see that it's very beneficial to structure their career pathing in a way that gets them exposed to many different parts of the company. So the first part of that number two, if you will, is to spend time in various parts of the business. It might be leading a change initiative, supply chain, finance, or whatever it might be, to learn something about another part of the business. I used to see the classical argument between sales, marketing, and operations, right? Well, learn to what it's like to work in those people's shoes a little bit, and you'll see why they have very strong points of view. But it also gives you more of an eclectic view about the company. Uh, the second part of that is when you're on this projection and someone says, um, well, these are my needs, wants, and expectations. This is the boss sharing it with you. And one of your responses about, well, Tom, let me share with you what one of my needs is, is that would it be possible to have either a coach or mentor assigned to me for a period of time that I could work with as I'm making this transition? More often than not, they're going to say, sure, that's a great idea. And I may not have a coaching structure, which you know is something most companies need to. But I think it's fair to ask that. Then they may say, no, we don't do that. But at least it's fair to ask for that. Uh, I have a very strong feeling about it. it's really important to lead some kind of change or project management initiative because again you get into the behavioral aspects of deliverables and people's how they react to certain circumstances and what's on people's mind resistance etc and then soft skills training like what Tom was faced with communications management stakeholder management listening to others etc and once you get involved in doing that you get some feedback, right, about how am I doing. You don't want to wait to the end of the year. You may want to get that feedback quarterly. How am I transitioning through some of these things? Am I making some headway? And then that leads to other coaching scenarios where you get that leadership feedback. So that, that's my step number two. You know, and uh, I spent some time in, in, a, in a company that outplaced in the time when oil really sank. And guys with huge salaries are being laid off like crazy. And, um, you know, I'd say to them, see if you can get back into another part of the company where you have not worked before to get an understanding of the holistic operation of the company to make you more marketable to the company, even if you have to take a reduction in what you were earning and career, et cetera, to learn that other avenue and you make that, make that path forward. Uh, number three, to learn some trust building skills. And this will be another little quiz we're going to go to. I make this uh, pretty simple. Let me put these out here. There are six trust building skills uh, that in combination, I should say, there are six things that when done, not all at the same time, create trusting relationships. And this may take a little time. And uh, they're not necessarily in order, but I just want to put up some definitions of these first. 
And I'll jump through some slides here, not talk about each one of these. Okay. First one I'll talk about is commonality. Uh, this one is basically share experiences where I can relate to the other person. Uh, this has been one of the strongest things I find that people can actually do to create trust-based relationships. Now, that means you go into an office, you see things on the wall, uh, where they went to school, you see the magazines on their desk, uh, things like that, right? And you can, you can relate to that. You know, they, they have some uh, symbol or attribute in their office that ideally you can talk to. Now, why would that be important? Well, first of all, it creates, reduces some stress in the immediate conversation you're having, and they bring, begin to see it's something I have in common with this person. Now, I did something pretty weird that most people probably wouldn't do, and I was going to bring Vivian tonight, who's my wife, to help me on some of these, to validate that I actually do this. Well, once a month, I send her out to Barnes & Noble, and I said, I want you to pick out 10 magazines, 10 subscriptions of things that you think I ought to read, and, uh, or just go through. And so this is the last uh, foray of the magazines that she gave that I got. One is um, uh, Building Railroad Model Craftsmen, uh, Fish International, Bird Talking, uh, Bass Playing, uh, cooking light, store, uh, stamp collecting, uh, making your husband love art, uh, uh, let's see, American Alligator, and your pol bipolar life. I don't know if you know the clients that I'm working with, but why would I ask you to do that and to read through those magazines every month? Why would I want to waste my time, money, and effort to read that diverse group and she picks out 10 every month that she gets a porn note thing on. Now why would I waste my time doing that? All right, broad is my perspective. What about that perspective? What about that perspective? Yes. Gives you the ability to talk to a variety of different people. There you go. It gives me the ability to talk to now. Uh, big bone hunting in safari desert, I may have zero interest in that, right? But I at least want to be familiar enough with the language where I see big game hunting on the desk there. I can say, oh, well, it looks like you're invested in that 386 2142 that just came out. Oh, yeah, you know about that? Well, I'm not a connoisseur, but I, I've kind of looked into that a little bit. It gives you some way to break the ice with people and to talk about things in a variety of areas that I had very, very, very little interest in, such as bird talking, right? I mean, not something, my wife happens to be an artist and I have very little interest in art, but she's dragged me to enough art galleries that I can talk about it intelligently with about anybody, right? So it gives you a much broader perspective. It actually makes you a more interesting person. Uh, so let's just say that commonality is a really beginning trust building element to find something with that individual that you can have in common with them to begin that conversation. Uh, transparency, emotions, uh, I feel comfortable discussing this. I may not have the best solution for you, and I may be transparent and say I don't, but I think an option you might consider is X, right, and here's why. So being transparent, it's pretty obvious. People can see through non-transparency pretty, pretty clearly. Uh, respect, held in regard, the person sees me as an equal. Uh, I've got a lot of education, I've worked all over the world and done different things, but when I meet with people, man, we're both human beings. You know, we both have life experiences that I find damn interesting. And I want to learn from that, I want to see that person as an equal, not that one is better or not. Uh, I worked and did some project once for a company, a consulting company, and the, uh, one of the consultants uh, actually went to MIT and worked afterwards. The first three words he would tell people when he sat down at the table about his MBA from MIT in Wharton. I mean, and immediately turned off every engineer in the room and never wanted to see that guy again, right? And he kept saying, like, hey, man, nobody cares about that, right? Shut up about that. You're not presenting yourself as an equal here of someone who has some base interest. Uh, Karen, motives and empathy. I can trust him or her to care about me or us. Now, there's a big difference here between empathy and sympathy. Uh, sympathy is like this. Well, okay, Tom, so Joe, so what's been happening? Well, you know, things are not too great. My wife divorced me, my kid's an alcoholic and drug addict. I just filed for bankruptcy and I think I'm going to get terminated from my job. And being sympathetic might say, well, you probably should kill yourself, right? I mean, so that's not the ideal circumstance. Empathy is more like, sounds like 
time, you're going through kind of a rough time, if I can be of help in any way, feel free that you can call on me. I know this too shall pass. You've had some rougher times that will occur. So being empathetic sometimes is all people want. They're not looking for your sympathy. They're looking for your empathy, that I listen, I care, and I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate that. So that's your kind of caring. Credibility, I can trust what they say about something. You know, the old saying about, this is not the first rodeo I've ever been to. I've been down this path before. And I love this one about, uh, you know, credibility is like, you know, it, if I haven't done this before, there's a transparency, I'm going to tell you I haven't. But if I have, I'm going to show you four or five examples where I have done this and what the results look like. You know, these are credible success stories. You can check with people, and this is what works. Uh, and the last one, not necessarily in this order, is reliability. I can trust him or her to do what they say they're going to do. Now, I know every one of you have had craftsmen or technical people come to your home to fix your AC, TV, plumbing, etc., and they will definitely be there by 2 o'clock, and then four days later they show up and wonder why you're not home, right? So reliability is basically saying, if I say at 2 o'clock I will deliver this, or this will be done by such and such a time, I can be a reliable person that you can count on. And if I can't count on your reliability, and if I can't count on your caring, and if I can't count on your respect, I have no commonality, I don't trust what you say, and I have no transparency, believe me, you're not going to have a relationship with that person. Right? So these six things, if you will, in combinations create trust-based relationships. Now, here's your quiz. Let me see if you can remember these. So some of these can go either way. As I was looking at this last night, I said, well, you could argue. But let's see. Uh, go back. You know, okay. So the first statement says, uh, can I share with you, and I'm talking to someone, maybe a colleague or a boss or client or whatever, some digital workspace lessons I have learned with other technology projects I have worked on. Which one of those six trust-based things are we referencing here, do you think? And the clue is lessons learned from other technology projects I have worked on. Take a guess. Okay, credibility, right? I mean, you know, I've worked on some other projects and I'm going to share some things with you. Number two, I appreciate the Agile workforce ideas you were sharing. Can we talk about the pros and cons of each of these ideas? Which one of the trust building things we have here? Respect. 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 But there's also some transparency here too, right? I'm not going to be hiding things. Um, empathetic to the lack of customer loyalty situation your sales team is in. Let's brainstorm some ideas. Caring. Caring. Caring, yeah. I'm caring enough to talk through this. Uh, I'm thinking about what you said. I feel that a less complicated data processing management alternative is what is needed now. A less alternative, less expensive. What do you think? Take a guess. If I know how to work the slide thing, I'd go back and let <laughs> <laughs> The opposite button? Down. Yeah, I don't want to screw it up. Well, this one, uh, this one I think is transparency because I'm talking about, I may not be able to have the best solution here, but I have a, a less alternative for you. As promised today, clue, I will share with you our enterprise integration goals, objectives, priorities, and the targets for the year. Okay, great. The last one, if you failed this one, you should leave immediately. My son plays on the Blue Devils team, soccer team too. Ah, uh, bingo. Okay, commonality, right? So, I mean, some of these are a little argumentative, right? But if you go back to those six things, these are things that really begin to play into how people, how people technically see you. So that's part of trust building skills. I, I do a workshop just the whole day and half a day just on building trust building skills that elaborate on these, what I call the six golden rules of building trust. Uh, we just talked about mastering some soft skills specifically, but uh, let me put this question up here and see if you can get this one correct. What do people love most more than anything else in the world? Recognition. Recognition, what else? Their name. Their name, what else? Okay. 
The answer is, what do people most love anything else in the world? They love talking about themselves, right? Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Right? So that's what people love most in the world is to talk about themselves. A leader always first listens and then asks the right question. So at the end of the day, in conversations, you see people gradu graduate to talking about themselves mostly. And your challenge here is to listen as much as, as you can. Uh, the next is being a transformational change champion. And what I want to share here with you is how some of these things have radically changed over the last couple of years. So I have what's defined as frame shifting. In other words, what's changing and why does it matter now in companies? So we have kind of the old assumptions. And as I've talked to many, many companies and many leaders in roles, I'm seeing a dramatic shift from the old assumptions to the new assumptions. And what are some of these? Uh, leadership defines and drives changes. It's only the leader's job versus everyone understands change management and is a change agent. Not for change sake in and of itself, but they are a change agent to support the business case. Experienced players are the most important and innovative leaders. And that's kind of an old assumption. However, today it's mostly Smart millenniums, you look at intergenerational issues now in companies, can be the most innovative and important for change leadership. There's five, probably five generational issues in companies that are from millenniums and all the other categories you want to say. They all have a different perspective about, about work. Baby boomers run our traditional organization or the source of key ideas. We have total, we have to take advantage of each generational strengths to be high performing. Every one of those generational workforce components has something to contribute. Formal networks are the way decisions are always made and executed. Formal networks, right? Being replaced by informal networks are now even more important than formal networks. That's really old school. Yeah. Because the Japanese did that for years. Everything was done by committee. Right, exactly. Even in the 1980s, we were right. fighting against that. And in fact, now in companies that I work with, one of the first, when they bring on a new employee, they have to sign up for at least three to four informal networks that they will, they will participate in on a regular basis. So the old school that just formal networks is the case. Mature legacy systems are sustainable. I don't think so. Ambiguous information, sensors, cloud access, digitization, and integration is now the priority. An agile workforce uh, drives digital business. Cloud power, machine learning. Analytics and measurement is where the truth lies, and management making investment decisions off the shelf where software is cheap, past historical data, made decisions about the future. No, it's now analytics and measurement is where the truth lies, and off the shelf software is good enough, making investments in digital analytics. This is stuff I see over and over again in companies that I work with, over and over again. So a real shift from old assumptions to new assumptions. The successful leader buys into this, or at least graduates to that end, to make that transition work successfully. Okay, so some final thoughts here. Uh, one, technical skills alone, as a situation with Tom, does not always lead to being a high-performance leader. And I think that's the whole point of what I've been talking about. Transitional leadership often requires taking a non-traditional career path. There is no substitute for an insightful self-assessment. You've got one for the price of admission, which was a nice dinner. Thank you for that. Building trust takes time to evolve, but be lost in an instant and hard to recover. Absolutely. The pathway to becoming leader requires five steps. Well, there might be 10 steps, four steps, 10 steps, at least you saw five. Soft skills, knowledge, and competencies are critical personal and professional strengths to acquire. Learn to manage change, or change will manage you. It's, uh, the only thing that you know, I have a slide once that said, change is inevitable, the exception of getting money back in a vending machine. I've never had that myself. <laughs> Anybody ever get change back in a vending machine? Never. It's inevitable, though. Uh, be aware of what is changing in the world of work. That's kind of the old assumptions and new assumptions. Uh, two years in one mouth. That's what my mother used to say. You get the point, Mark and live the ideal leader attributes. Now I'm gonna share with you after years of working in this area, and probably I've worked in this space for about over 30 years, these are the things that I've learned what ideally the high performance 
leader attributes. And this is this should be worth the price of admission, right? Because it's free. Okay, the first one is uh, you have to have the genius of Einstein, the vision of Jefferson, the strengths of Superman, Superwoman, uh, the patience of Gandhi, the communication skills of Roosevelt, the creativity of Da Vinci, the magnanimity of Sister Teresa, uh, I'll skip that one for a minute. The ambition of Donald Trump. <laughs> and the conviction of Churchill, never, never give up. And so if you can achieve all that, congratulations, but that's, uh, that's your goal for the evening. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention, for your hospitality and inviting me to this opportunity, which a lot of people had to jump through a lot of hoops to manage my schedule, which is always hectic, to be able to shift this from November to October. So it's um, a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate those who came and to hear this. And this is videotaped, so I'm assuming you'll be on your World Wide Web or YouTube or other ways for others that you want to share. So um, again, you have those cards if you want to give me your card to be on my blog list. If you know others in your own companies that would like to hear this kind of presentation, I do about 20 of these a year for different associations because I think it's just part of giving back uh, from my learnings and so on. So let me stop at this point and ask if you have any questions or want to throw out a situation that I want to point of humor. Very good presentation. Okay. Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank have you. a great afternoon.